Bostock uh, also moved to uh, UVA, where she has been an assistant professor ever since. Uh, so Ilse's uh, scholarship in astrochemistry and plant formation has been well recognized by the greater uh, scientific community, including an Annie Jump Cannon Award from the AAS, a Packard Fellowship, and I think most recently a Cottrell uh, Scholar. And one other thing is maybe uh, perhaps most salient for the students listening to this is that Ilsa has not been content with staying in her lane during this, uh, this decade of scholarship. So uh, she started out as a theorist. Her PhD was in astrochemistry theory. Uh, but uh, when she came here, she started developing the observer in her more and more. And by now, she is the PI of multiple ALMA and JWST proposals including the first Alma Lodge program looking at this chemistry in a statistical way. And with that, I give you also please. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It is absolutely delightful to see you all here and see so many familiar faces. This is in fact the first time I have been back since I uh, left in 2018, not for lack of trying. You know, the last few years have been a bit chaotic for all of us, but it's wonderful to be here and be able to share with you the work that's been going on in my research group over the last few years at, at UVA. So the overall uh, theme that you're gonna see here is that we're really interested in understanding planets and, and sort of the potential uh, planets out there by studying not the planets themselves, but the environments out of which they form. And so to motivate this kind of approach, I want to do a thought experiment. So I want you to picture a planet. What comes to mind? Maybe not the best thing to do right after lunch, I realize, but maybe, you know, <laughs> as I turn the lights down. But yeah, to think about this. Like, what do, you, what do you see? Do you possibly see something like Saturn? which is what you know, most of my students will say back to me when I ask them to do this exact, this exact exercise and draw it. Maybe you, know, you are a uh, solar system you know, mission aficionado where you're you know, thinking about the beautiful swirling waves on the planet Jupiter. We have these wonderful up-close examples, right? What if I instead ask you to now imagine an exoplanet? What do you see now? Do you maybe see one of the hundreds now of examples of exotic planets orbiting stars, you know, within seconds of the ends of their lives being shredded apart, maybe hazy, maybe multiple planets, always in some kind of weird exotic color, <laughs> realistic or not? Maybe many exotic colors. I don't know why this is such a trend now of taking Jupiter and changing like color change filter, right? These marble diagrams, you know. Artists and scientists both have been, have been pretty creative, you know, in, in, in the world of exoplanet and science art. All right, now I instead want you to imagine a habitable planet. All right, now what do you see? The vast majority of my students find it hard to actually imagine anything other than our Earth, you know, here as seen by uh, the Apollo 8 astronauts. Maybe, again, maybe there's some aficionados, there certainly are aficionados in the audience, and maybe you get a little bit more creative. Maybe you imagine like a water world. Maybe it's teeming with some intelligent tube worms. I don't know why I added intelligent in there, but like, let's, you know, just, just some imagination here, right? But on the whole, if I ask, you know, most people, astronomers included, when I ask folks to imagine what a habitable planet might look like, it's really hard not to actually see the Earth. And that's just, you know, because we don't have great other examples to, to inspire the imagination, at least not yet. Of course, this is not for lack of trying, right? Exoplanet science <laughs> has, you know, undergone such an explosion in the last few decades, going from discoveries of these absurd, you know, exotic, strange worlds to starting to put those into context with statistics, like are those actually common outcomes or not, to now going into this realm of detailed characterization, saying something more about what these planets are, you know, made of. Now, in terms of
terms of the latter, so when we're trying to study these exoplanets you know, in detail, the planets that we've gotten the best and most up-close information from are really those on the edges of the extremes. So you have the planets that are hovering around, whizzing around the surfaces of the host stars, right? These so-called transiting planets. And those are the ones for which we can get things like atmospheric features uh, it, as, as light pierces through their atmosphere uh, and reaches our telescopes. Maybe, if you're lucky, you can see some slight Doppler shifts in lines, but generally these are all relatively close. At the other end of, this, of the size of the, the size distribution, you know, you have cases where you have planets orbiting at distances far enough away from their central stars where you can sufficiently block away the light from the central star and detect those planets directly, typically when they're young, when they're self-luminous, and you can split the light out into spectra. But the point is, you know, the most of the detailed atmospheric compositional information we get not exclusively, but mostly, is easiest to get either very close to the host star, you know, within, well within an AU or less, or very far out, sort of beyond 15 AU or greater. There's a really important part of parameter space, I'd argue, in between, <laughs> that is quite difficult, quite challenging to get to. This, this part of parameter space overlaps with what, ooh, hello overlaps with uh, maybe these, you know, interesting water worlds or Earth-like planets and even the giant planet region and our solar system. Maybe we'll get a little bit lucky with the lower mass stars, these M-dwarfs, where we have some access to the habitable zone, uh, for, which is relatively close into the star. But on the whole, you know, when we're talking sun-like stars, it's hard. Now, this is not something that's going to be solved anytime soon. And even as we go into the, the next era of big glass, either ground-based glass or space-based gl space glass, figuring out or measuring in detail the compositions of, of small rocky planets around sun-like stars is something that's going to take a major concerted effort. So some, some estimates, depending on your level of optimism, <laughs> which you know, is, a, is a tunable parameter for many of us, <laughs> Some estimates put, you know, maybe a rocky Earth-like composition, Earth-like atmosphere, maybe is, you know, something like one in 28 rocky planets. That was at least one estimate here from a decadal white paper by Aki Reberg. If you take numbers, uh, predicted numbers for a facility like Louvre, you find that you need to spend years, years of time, not just all time, integration time, to find even just one such planet if it's really sort of a 1 in 28 type phenomenon. It's a major effort. A worthwhile effort, I'll say, but it's a really big investment. It's going to take a lot of time. And that's if you're optimistic, right? So while, we're, while these um, incredible technological feats are being developed, while these techniques are being honed and being improved and hopefully expedited, <laughs> There are, there's a parallel track we can take, and this is the track sort of my group takes. We're sort of changing up the question of something like, are we alone, to maybe something a little more watered down, but equally intriguing to me, are we unlikely to be alone? Okay, more specifically, if we look at planet forming systems over here, this is an actual image of the IM loop, one of my favorite disks, it's the IM loop disk scene in scattered light with VLT sphere. So you can see the dark lane, and this, it's kind of tilted like a bowl towards us. So if we study these systems, can we address questions like, you know, are the prebiotic ingredients, things like water, organic materials, or whatever you can imagine, whatever you think life might take, are these commonly available to forming planets? Are they commonly available near the host star? Are they commonly available further out? We can also ask questions like, what kinds of architectures of planetary systems are possible? How much mass is there? Is there enough to form a Jupiter? Is there enough to form you know, a massive planet far away from the host star? How is mass distributed? We can also examine cr the critical events on the way to forming the Earth and see if these things were common uh, for uh, stars uh, that are currently in the act of forming planets. This is not an exhaustive list. So the questions I'll, I'll mainly focus my talk on today, um, I've listed here, 
And th so this is the sort of approach our group takes. So we, our, main, our main goal is to use theory and observations, as Karin said, <laughs> to bring together sort of planet formation, physical structure, physical models, with astrochemical models to answer you know, questions like, how efficient is planet formation for a fixed amount of disk mass? What bulk compositions of planets are possible by looking at disks? And how can we observe them? And what are the most important physical processes that enable efficient or inefficient planet formation? What gr most greatly impacts the outcome of disk evolution? Now, what I'm going to talk about, I have to give credit to where it's due. <laughs> the work I'll, I'll share with you is a product of not, not just me uh, by any means. It's a product of my wonderful uh, group here. We're having lunch also with the laboratory, con laboratory astrophysics contingent at UVA here. We haven't gotten a proper group lunch, so you just have to instead like look at what we're eating. <laughs> we'll get a better one later. <laughs> but this is what I'll share with you is sort of an overview of what they're working on. And if you're if you want to hear more about the uh, methods, about the details, about the limitations, I'm always happy to chat. Come find me, email me, or, or talk to them. They're like fabulous people. I mean, I am biased, but. <laughs> All right, so the first question is, uh, what seems to be a rather simple one at first glance, how efficient is planet formation? We have a number we you know, often quote for star formation. Star formation, you know, maybe a few percent of the mass of interstellar material would get converted into stars. You think we would have that same number down for planets? It's a really hard question, as it turns out. So the idea is, you know, for a given amount of total mass of your disk, whether it's IM loop or whatever disk you prefer, how many, what's the average yield? What is the total number of planets you could form? Is there enough mass to form a Jupiter? How much rocky material is there to form a terrestrial planet or cores of gas giants? Historically, most of this has, uh, work has focused on the dust. Naturally, this has been one of the easier ways to go about this work, though not easy by any means. But this is purely a, an observational statement. So when we observe a uh, planet forming disks, the continuum is readily detectable via with SMA, with ALMA, and even in some cases, you know, we get these beautiful images like those uh, from the D-sharp sample. But if you now remove all that gorgeous, uh, res res highly resolved imagery and instead just plop all of your disks on a plot, when you're trying to answer whether planet formation is efficient or not, you actually quickly run into a problem. So on the upper left, this is a plot from High Smolders, uh, 20, I think 2021, yes, review. The distribution of planets by number versus mass compared to the distribution of amount of dust in a system, turns out it overlaps in a kind of terrifying way. So it looks like the distribution of, of mass of dust in disks effectively has to be entirely converted to planets to explain observed uh, Kepler planets or RV planets. So planet, this would mean planet formation would have to be 100% efficient, which nothing in astronomy or life or anything is ever 100% efficient. So that's something that, you know, is always worrying, right? Okay, maybe there are some solutions though. Maybe, you know, maybe planet formation already started. Maybe it got kicked off at an earlier stage, perhaps while the star is still forming. We have some evidence perhaps of that. Maybe um, the planetesimals are, are, have already long formed and they actually contain most of the mass. Or maybe dust growth has been so efficient and it's concentrated dust so well into rings and gaps that it's just become highly optically thick. Now, just to dig into this a little bit more, all of those are possibly, you know, fine solutions. However, there's this interesting puzzle right now in planet formation that if you compare the amount of dust mass you have to the mass accretion rate onto the star, you get a correlation. Now, you might say, okay, that's fine, you know, disk mass and accretion scaling. But the thing is, when you're, ta you're talking about viscous disk evolution, mass accretion rate should scale with the gas mass. It shouldn't scale with the dust mass. So if you think about this a little bit more deeply, you find that, like, even if this dust is being converted into an unseen form, into planets, it has to do it in a way that preserves the gas to dust ratio. Does this mean like gas and dust is, are being converted at equal scale, equal levels into planets? That would be weird. So there's still a lot of questions here we don't understand when we look at our dust masses, what they actually mean. 
Okay, you might say, well, dust is complicated. We barely understand what's going on. How about you just stick to the gas? Gas in the inter interstellar medium is 99% of the total um, mass by weight. So, you know, why aren't we just going after the gas anyway? ALMA has been transformative in our observations of um, molecular material around, uh, around these young stars and observing the disks. Over here is a gorgeous image by Rich Teague uh, showing a surface extracted from beautiful high resolution deep CO observations of a particular system, HD 16396. But even here, we're unfortunately still looking at a tracer. We're looking not at molecular H2, we're looking at CO. And over the past few years, we've discovered that even CO Turns out it's complicated. The simplest molecule beyond H2, and yet it's chemically evolving, and it's not very good at tracing mass. So what are we left with in our gas mass toolbox? Not a whole lot to work with. We talked about CO here. Turns out CO is unfortunately chemically interesting. It doesn't have a reliable X factor equivalent like we have for you know, galaxies. All right, the dust. Well, it's rapidly growing, evolving, maybe forming planets. So it's a really not the best way to measuring total mass. All right, so there's, not, there's one final tool in our toolbox. We need to turn H, H2, molecular hydrogen, into an observable form. And to do that, we can substitute out a hydrogen for a deuterium, and we get HD. Yay, solved. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a way to observe it for the last decade. To really get it, like how important it is to have a reliable mass tracer, we compiled, or I, I tried to grab from literature every possible point, every possible estimate for the disk mass of just one, per, one source, one well-studied source, TW Hydra. If your point is not on here, I'm sorry. I did my best. <laughs> here we have all these different points. These are all different mass estimates using you know, slightly different techniques. And on the bottom, on the x-axis, you can see the disk mass ranges from you know, 0.001 to 0.1. <laughs> factor of 100 variation in the overall mass. But don't worry so much about the color coding, you know, what depends more on gas versus dust at the bottom. The main thing I want to just really point out, though, there's a lot of variation. But when you bring or fold in HD emission into the mix, you actually can pretty much narrow it down pretty well into this yellow box. You can get disk masses to better within a factor of two and, and even up to within 50% if you have very good uh, information about your temperature structure of your disk and the excitation of this molecule. Now, TW Hydra was one of the lucky ones. It had that HD observation made here. This was this is a re-reduction of the original data over here, but you see this is the J equals one to zero rotational line of HD. Only two other disks had successful detections before Herschel retired in 2013, before it ended its mission. All of these have been spatially and spectrally unresolved, yet they've transformed the field in some sense to, to give us a total constraint on the overall mass, evidence that CO was chemically evolving, and in some cases, the realization that gas over dust ratio seems to be kind of frighteningly constant over time. And we haven't had sufficiently sensitive far infrared eyes to do this recently. We have a, another opportunity to, to measure this key mass tracer, to understand planet formation efficiency, uh, actually, in the near future, in uh, 2024, uh, the ASTROS mission, PI'd by Jorge Pineda, will launch. Now, ASTROS is actually not designed to do disk science really primarily at all. It's mainly an ISM physics mission. But as part of it, there will be a proof of concept uh, measurement of velocity resolved HD towards at least one, and per we're hoping for two disks uh, with this mission. Over here, it's the largest mirror balloon uh, mirror to fly, I think it's about eight feet. The uh, structure around it was designed based on like, it's carbon fiber and it's based around racing sailboats, <laughs> like the, the architecture is, to make sure it stays rigid because it's a one giant rigid, uh, or it's multiple panels, but the mirror flies, it doesn't fold out, it, just, it flies as is. And we're lucky to be um, a key part of the team to do the HD analysis here with my um, student, Amanda Alvarado. But Astros, like I said, it's not actually designed to study disks. We'll get one, maybe two more detections. I'm really excited about another H emission that's being uh, proposed as we speak, you know, deadline in like a week. <laughs> the Planetary Origins and Evolution Multispectral Monochromator, or POEM for short, a lot easier to say. This, among many lines, uh, this mission was planning to target HD 1 to 0, uh, as well as water. 
to improve our sample of disks with reliable masses to understand this issue of planet formation efficiency, dispersal timescales, it'll improve it by an order of magnitude. Um, it's led by Gordon Stacy and, and your own Gary Melnick here, CFA. And if it's accepted, proposed launch of 2027. So hey, half, half a decade in the future. There's a third option actually on the table. Um, so as part of the Astro 2020 decadal, one of the key recommendations was for a, a far, far infrared and or X-ray probe scale mission. Uh, one of the ones, uh, the one I'm most excited about on the far infrared side is first. It'll provide the sensitivity, the spectral coverage, um, and, uh, and also the, the bandwidth coverage to do both HD science among many other cases. And the nice thing about it is it's not limited to a single balloon flight and it will be a 90% open time facility with a huge spectral range. So it's very exciting uh, on the future. Okay, so that's the future, but what do we do now? <laughs> we have, you know, what, how do we solve this problem now? I don't, I'm not very patient, you know? So what do we do with the data we have? The Alma Archive is now reaching a point where there's over a petabyte of data. We hit, uh, the Alma Archive hit a petabyte at 2020. I don't even know where it is right now, but it's huge. The Alma Archive has tons and tons of molecular data, a large amount of molecular data on disks. I could count up 50 plus <laughs> from, from what I know of, but I know there's, there's far more than that uh, probably on the archive that I don't even know about. So can we calibrate this existing submillimeter emission including CO, to estimate disk mass now and not wait for these HD emissions to fly. My student Amina Didap is trying to do just this uh, by taking into account that these chemical environments around disks are incredibly complex, and, but they, they are, can behave in predictable ways. So by disentangling the effect of the density structure, the temperature structure, the radiation fields, can we figure out how all these different parameters are coupled and affect CO abundance at the end of the day? Are there any instances where CO can just be used as a reliable mass tracer and let us get to this question of how efficient is planet formation? So Amina uh, is a self-trained uh, data science uh, ex black belt uh, in addition to you know, uh, being part of our astronomy PhD program. And so Amina took one of our astrochemical models, never looked at the inner working guts, had all the physical structure as the inputs and the CO as the output. And used explanatory machine learning methods, not predictive, but explanatory methods, to try and efficiently disentangle what are the most unique and impactful combinations of parameters that change CO in the way they do. Can we back calibrate CO? And so this was a sort of her overall sample for which she trained her models on. She used regression-based techniques. Again, I'm happy to chat about this if you're interested in the details. But one of her key findings was that dense gas that was cosmic ray radiated or dense gas that's X-ray radiated is the most susceptible to destroying the CO and hopefully can be backed out as a way to correct CO down the line. She also finds that CO is very much, much more resilient in warm environments, like Herbig-type disks, and so should be a much more ma reliable mass tracer there. Now, the, none of this is actually surprising. These were things found uh, via previous studies that were more brute force in nature. People spending thousands, tens of thousands of CPU hours just to create chemical models to just do brute force parameter space, space studies. Her analysis took minutes, and she came up with the same solution relatively quickly. And so this uh, work, which we're about to submit, uh, so say, uh, be on the lookout, uh, will, is really highlighting that machine learning can also be used as a tool for understanding complex chemical models with many uh, in, uh, dependent variables. So just to summarize this part of my talk, you know, one of the most important challenges ahead of planet formation science is really just measuring the disk mass, something that sounds so simple, right? But we need to do it to understand you know, how common are you know, the, the formation of Jupiter mass planets, how efficient is planet formation in the end of the day, and also, I didn't get into it much, but what is the time scale of planet formation? How quickly do disks disperse? What is the clock we have to deal with? So the next topic I want to just cover here is understanding or studying disks to understand what kinds of bulk compositions are possible. What is the distribution of gas, ice, and rock? And what kinds of planets could be made out of it? And how do these change with time? How do they change with the different environment? Whether you're in a cluster or near a massive star, for example. 
Now these disks, they, they span uh, many orders of magnitude and density and temperature structure, radiation fields. There are many different distinct chemical environments across a single system. And so there's a question, how do these get actually incorporated into planets? How do they get incorporated into the solid component, into the icy cores? How do they get accreted into the atmosphere? Now, this, um, this inspired now what is, I would, I would call, I would argue this is now an iconic plot. I, I think so, Karin. <laughs> an iconic plot of Karin's from 2011 that put out the idea that these natural gradients here of just hotter going to cooler, right? Denser to less dense makes a very interesting prediction for what the compositions under just a pure freeze out scenario, what the con compositions of planets might look like. So as you get further from the star, it gets cooler, things will freeze out. You cross these so-called snow lines and you get pretty big jumps in the compositions a planet might inherit. And so if you encapsulate this in something like the carbon to oxygen uh, ratio, as you cross, for example, a water snow line, more oxygen freezes out, your gas phase is now gonna be relatively more carbon rich, so your C to O ratio jumps. Correspondingly, you drop in the ice. Now this, uh, made, some, uh, made many people excited because this ratio was something that was within reach of atmo uh, exoplanet atmospheric constraints. Exoplanet atmospheres should change with varying C to O ratios. Their abundances should change. This should be something we can extract out uh, back. And from that, maybe we can say something about where a planet formed despite where we see it today. So the last sort of 10 years, I would say, is trying to say, well, can we actually do this? Can we connect back to that disk environment from a given C over O ratio? And my answer right now is still in the maybe zone. Freeze out has to happen. So we have to have these jumps at snow lines. But we also know disks now are an extremely complicated chemical puzzle. They're not staying put. They are dynamical objects. Ice is growing, it's settling, it's moving, it's drifting inward towards the star. And this is something uh, we've, uh, that, that came out of models, but is also borne out in data. The disks are really chemically complex. I think the MAP survey, uh, the MAPS ALMA large program, really brought this to the forefront. So here you're seeing uh, on the top row, five different disks observed with the same molecular tracer, HCN. They look completely different, right? Some are centrally peaked, some are double ringed, totally different structures. You might say, well, hey, maybe all these disks are just, they have different ring structures. Maybe there are planets forming in all these different rings. What, you know, we don't know what's going on. But if instead you fix the system, in this case the source, and look at it in five different molecules, you see the same thing. Totally different chemical faces for the same system. If these were rings and gaps carved by planets, they should look the same, and it's not. We see radial chemical structure, a planet forming at each radii will be chemically distinct. And it, and it doesn't stop there, right? So the map survey, here are the five different disks observed and the molec molecules across from left to right. It's an incredible diversity of, of many different structures, rings, mainly azimuthal, which is interesting. But uh, for the most part, lots of different radial structures. Okay, so are there any patterns in the madness? Well. Charles had a lovely paper, um, also part of the MAPS collaboration, trying to quantitatively figure this out. I don't expect you to pull anything out <laughs> necessarily of this graph, except for each of these cross, cross terms here is the combination of two different molecules. And whether it's light or dark tells you if it's similar or dissimilar. These are two different systems, left to right. And if you just focus on the one on the left, some of the, the, white, the lighter patches highlight that molecules like CN, C2H, CHCN are all kind of similar, follow a similar pattern. But unfortunately, when you look at that same combination to another disk, they are un they're not alike. So you can find patterns in a single disk and they don't necessarily go from disk to disk. So are disks just chemically diverse and does this mean planets are gonna be chemically diverse as well? Well, if we compare the planets, with C over O ratio as our proxy. Our best estimates of C over O uh, and disks are shown here in the lines. For planets, they're shown here, uh, at, at least a subsample are shown here as the, as the points. The takeaway on this plot is that 
disks tend to be relatively high. These are measured mainly from hydrocarbon emission, very bright hydrocarbon emission. Disks tend to be very high. We are measuring larger scales, but on the whole, we're measuring things like C over O of one or even greater. If we focus instead, you know, on of the inner planets, but rather the direct, the, the directly imaged planets, they're completely, they completely disagree. Maybe you could say the inner disk planets on the left in the blue region, there's more better agreement, but uh, from that you can see that there's still a lot of variation. Those are the error bars on the two disks, AA Tau done with Spitzer, GM, uh, GM, GW Loop was with JWST actually recently by Sierra Grant. They overlap with the perimeter space, but there is actually a lot of variety spanning from much uh, lower than subsolar to, to higher than solar values of C over O. And we can't, I mean, we can focus our efforts over, you know, staring at the plot on the left. We actually can't ignore what's going on over here with ALMA. Since this is the bulk mass of the disk, and we think at least some planets are going to migrate from this outer region inward. So we should see some of these extremely high cases if these systems are currently forming planets, and that's a big if. There's also a question if, the sample that I show you here on this graph is actually representative. Is there actually a tension between known disks and planets? Are these the same population that are going to form the planets shown there? We need, a, we need a larger sample to truly know. So I'm happy to report, as, as Karin uh, alluded to, we are uh, going to go after such a sample. The disk exoplanet connection, haha. -ha, pun there, not my pun, that was Ted's, Ted Bergen's idea there. The DECO program is an almost cycle nine program um, to try and estimate C over O ratios and gas masses for a large sample of disks, 80 disks with 40 to 50 AU resolution. So giving us inside of CO snow line, outside of CO snow line constraints. And here our co-PI team, all women co-PI team uh, down here on the, on the bottom right. We're going after simple species that are readily observable to try and estimate uh, both the C over O and the gas, as well as the metallicity, the C over H uh, ratio. And from this, we should be able to also back out the disk mass. We should be able to calibrate CO, hooray. Our team, I am very fortunate to be part of this, this really lovely team. Um, we actually just started getting data this past January. So I, and I feel like I'm like, it's a lot of buildup and I don't get to actually show you data because it's still in weblog form. But <laughs> stay tuned for the next couple of months as more of the data uh, is, is, is released to us. But we're not all just sitting and waiting. We have our chemical modeling team, including Amina Diop, who are working on building the models to take the fluxes that are observed, extract, get masses, get C over O ratios. Uh, we have a team that's uh, developing uh, novel calibration techniques so that we can sort of auto calibrate this large data set in an efficient way. Um, it's a, it's a fa fabulous group of folks and many, many familiar faces you probably recognize here. We're now a team of 43 collaborators spanning four continents, eight countries. eight countries, and seven time zones, which of course makes telecons really hard to schedule, as you all know. <laughs> but we're, I, what I love especially about this group is that we're a lar there's a large folks focus on the early career. So 38% of our team are students or postdocs, the people that are you know, doing this wonderful work. Our sample is, is uh, we try to create a sample that's um, a fairly uniform, extracted from previous ALMA surveys of lupus, taurus, ophiuchus, and chameleon. We're getting down to sort of a Neptune mass of gas. And we're, they've been divided um, between M dwarf type and solar types. So we should be able to see whether these are inherently different systems, whether they'll have inherently different compositions in their disks. We also had to do, use three spectral settings to get the lines we were interested in. So there's a lot of bonus science, all packaged into 150 of hours of ALMA time. We'll be doing, like, if you love deuterium, we'll be doing D to H ratios. We'll be looking at small organics, uh, localizing it using excitation. We'll do some sulfur work. Uh, we'll be looking also at things like stellar masses from the kinematics of the disks, watching the Keplerian orbits uh, from the various molecular species and seeing if they're the same, which actually tells you something cool about the emitting height of the gas. We get different answers. We're looking for non-Keplerian motions and, and much more. Okay, but this whole talk I'm trying to connect to planets, 
And we're talking about scales and disks that span, obviously, many tens, hundreds of AU. How do these actually relate to the vast majority of planets for which we have atmospheric constraints? Those like whizzing about the host star, the, the, the uh, surface of the host star. But I just want to remind you that these are not uniform or not isolated systems. We have tons of transport uh, within these systems. We have um, ice, we have organics, we have material moving uh, throughout these systems, maybe getting trapped into gaps, for example. So uh, my postdoc, or former postdoc now, <laughs> Dr. Dana Anderson, uh, who has moved on, she's now Carnegie EPL fellow. She examined whether we pollute the inner disk with a variety of different combi uh, combinations of organics or carbonaceous grains, and she made predictions for how bright lines should be. All these points are just different assumptions for different amounts of pollution or maybe a different temperature structure. All this wonderful, complicated work ended up pulling out one interesting and resilient fact that the disk mainly cared about the carbon to oxygen ratio of the gas. It didn't care where it came from, so if you want to learn about history, I'm sorry. But if all you care about is the inner disk carbon to oxygen ratio, I have great news for you. You're, you're in luck here. We should be able to pull this out relatively straightforwardly uh, with MIRI type spectra. And as actually as part, um, well, as, as a bonus product from DECO, um, at least 18 of the DECO targets will actually have JWST MIRI spectra in cycle one. So we should be able to see whether the composition of the outer disk in any way does imprint on the inner disk. And there are lots of model predictions now out there for a chemically evolving static disk, something with icy pebble drift, or maybe something where you trap the pebbles, you strand them out in the outermost disk, uh, raising the carbon to oxygen ratio by removing the water. And this is the beautiful spectrum from Sierra Grant's GW, GW loop paper. So this is the quality of data JWST is providing of spectra of these inner disks. We have everything we need here to extract C over O ratio. We have hydrocarbons, we have water. They even have 13 CO, you know, they have isotopologues. It's really beautiful. Okay, so this has all been the gas. All right, so what is the ice phase uh, doing at the same time? So uh, the solids are important. They're forming the rocky cores of the giant planets. They're forming the terrestrial planets. They're forming the, the, the you know, the icy uh, cometary belts. So what do we, can we learn? What can we hope to see with uh, the upcoming facilities on the terms of the icy component of disks? Well, here I'm also optimistic. So the, we, um, my postdoc here, Dr. Nick Bellering, created some synthetic models, taking the outputs of our chemical calculations and creating detailed models of the radiative transfer of how all the different ice species interplay and imprint. And because he was doing this in a fully resolved way, he could make, you know, put slits down so he could see where the ice features would peak up depending on where you look in the disk. So if you had, you know, perfect resolution across the disk, you could see uh, in the surface water absorption, but not much like CO absorption, for example, because you don't have much CO ice up there. But as you get deeper, like the purple line, purple, a bar here, now you get the CO ice feature popping up. Another uh, finding from the study was that uh, methanol ice will be, will be pretty hard, so if you like organic ice, that'll be a little bit tricky, unless a large amount was inherited early on. All right, so we have, we're excited about these predictions, and, and many observations are incoming. We're curious uh, ourselves whether we can actually see this predicted shifting of ice mass spatially through the disk. We're going to be testing this as well um, in actually a couple of weeks. We have an accepted JWST Cycle 1 program to use near camp and coronography mode to block out the light from a central star of a particular disk, B4046 Sagittarius, where VLT sphere identified serendipitously 50 background stars. So this disk is B4046 Sagittarius, i.e. against the galactic center, so lots and lots of background stars to work with. This is the Alma gas distribution. So if there's ice at these outer radii, we should be able to find them as a darkening at the three micron feature via absorption uh, against, this, against the disk, against these background stars, and as a darkening in the albedo of the reflected light. So that's, these are observations that are coming in like two weeks, so this will be fun. <laughs> Never done coronography before, so wish me luck. This will be exciting. All right, so how much time? All right, perfect. Okay, so I'll, then I'll, I'll go through uh, my final piece here. 
the physical nature of disks. How efficient is planet formation? And what are the most important physical processes that drive, um, drive either the disk evolution or its ability to actually form planets in the first place? So you might say, well, haven't we learned a ton about you know, physics of interstellar medium, chemistry of interstellar medium? Well, it turns out disks are actually a fundamentally different regime than the ISM. Really, really high densities, so reactions happen really fast. Grain evolution is transporting volatiles all over the place, and so it's you know, not uniform and by any means. Not that the ISM is either, but it's a sort of a time-dependent, different sort of beast. And you also are sitting, you have a central, very chaotic star in the middle, sort of stirring the overall pot. So in addition to being chemically homogeneous, disks are physically, I'm oh, sorry, chemically heterogeneous, heter ah, words, heterogeneous, disks are also physically heterogeneous. We have so many different processes going on. We can be externally UV irradiated, the central star, like I said, very uh, bright across the spectrum, ultraviolet X-ray emission, <coughs> excuse me. Disk might be threaded with magnetic fields. Um, those magnetic fields might stir the disk, make it turbulent. So many of these processes are really important and often highly coupled. They can impact disk chemistry and they can affect how disks actually go into forming planets. So we want to understand what are the most important processes on this diagram that actually impact the result of planet formation. So the central star is perhaps, I'd argue, one of the most important parts. And um, to illustrate this, you know, we're, we're starting to see, models have shown this for a little while, but it's, we're starting to actually see it also in the data. So some beautiful work by Jamila Peggy's, including a paper I saw in the archive today, referenced here, um, your, your own Jamila, uh, showed that if you compare the fluxes of different lines, you see that, well, okay, the little, the little guys and the big guys, the crosses, you know, it kind of looks like a continuum. Maybe the, these large and small uh, systems are not that dissimilar from solar type stars and their chemistry. Maybe they, maybe they would form similar planets. Oops. That's okay. That was scary. <laughs> but if you look in the detail, uh, if you look at the ratios of different lines, okay, they seem to be sort of uniform. They seem to be kind of flat graph to graph. But in detail, you actually start to see some interesting things peek out. The MDORF type systems have higher hydrocarbon abundances, and strangely, they have lower deuterium abundances. And for those that are, you know, chemistry enthusiasts, you know, deuterium chemistry typically happens in cold environments. So what is this? So maybe, maybe we're seeing an evidence of icy pebbles forming in the outer disk and then moving, being migrating inward towards the central star. So we're seeing the left behind stuff that's been zapped of, of cold, water vapor and highly deuterated material, perhaps. But we need more disks to actually tell. But if we put this in context with known planet, or yeah, known planet hosts, maybe this picture isn't too crazy. So N-dwarf type systems actually seem to host more planets on average than their equivalent FGK type. So High Smolders in 2021 suggested that perhaps this is a result of unrestricted pebble drift. Essentially, these systems weren't able to form a gas giant, or they couldn't form it early enough that the inner disk basically was flooded with pebbles from the outer disk, and then efficiently planets could form in the inner disk. And so this leads, you know, how else can stellar properties actually change the environment? If it's changing the inner disk composition and it's changing the rate of planets forming, you know, what else can stars do? And it turns out quite a lot. And so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but maybe I will. <laughs> here we go, oh no, okay, here we go. Uh, I have like a magical fast forward button in here, but now I don't know how to use it. Okay, I think this is, it. all right. No, I, it didn't work. Okay, I had a magical fast forward button. Okay, you'll have to bear with me. I'll speed through this a little bit. I tried new technology this morning, terrible idea. Um, all right, so um, just to, to illustrate a few other ways in which the, uh, the environment or the star plays an important role. Um, actually, here's a, just a beautiful press release image from PDRs for All, a JWST program. Uh, here you see how you have the different filamentary structure, but also the disks embedded in them. And these disks in the in Orion-like clusters are being disrupted. The environment is clearly playing a major role. But we, there's a question if the disks here are the, really the ones we should be focusing on, or if the disks in the outskirts of the cluster you know, might have a different evolutionary uh, path. Some recent ALMA observations suggest that the composition of disks 
in the outermost regions of Orion don't look that dissimilar from the disks of like Taurus or Lupus or nearby star-forming regions. And theory suggests that actually at relatively low G0, at a half parsec distant from the central cluster, it's actually kind of nice. It's like the suburbs of the cluster region. And at these same radii, it seems like about 70% of the stars with disks actually lie out there. And so one of my students, Rachel Gross, is working on trying to understand and model how this sort of moderately irradiated region can change the composition of the outer disk, outer cometary belts, and understand if we can actually observe it using ALMA observations. Stars are also incredibly highly variable across the spectrum. So here is one of my favorite movies of the Chandra uh, uh, Orion Ultra Deep project, the Coop survey, showing the, gl the glittering stellar fluctuations in x-rays. There are questions of whether this impacts the discomposition immediately or cumulatively. How much does the variability matter? We had some observational evidence that molecular ions might be variable in time a few years ago, but what else? So uh, Abby Wagner, a uh, chemistry PhD student, found that through detailed simulations, taking into account the stochastic history of flares, you could shift, you could both time, uh, time variably impact the abundance of key ions, but you could also entirely shift the baseline of what molecular compositions are present in these systems. And while these are small changes, we're talking a few percent, the simulation was only run over 500 years. So given the you know, proper amount of time, this could have a major change in molecular abundances. And the final <laughs> project I'll highlight, just as my students, Daryl Long. Daryl is investigating whether the core of the disk, the midplane, the planet-forming region, is impacted uh, differently in different environments. The same uh, region has the least amount of stellar radiation present, but it's most strongly impacted by the environment, by the external uh, either UV radiation or cosmic ray-driven chemistry. And so she's investigating whether disks in different environments can have a variety of midplane chemistries. But at the moment, she's actually struggling to even fit the most turbulent disk we know about, DM Tau. We thought maybe this one, of all disks, might have a, a high ionization fraction in its midplane because it's so turbulent. We think it's being mixed up by its magnetic fields. Turns out that even here, this disk is very difficult to constrain. Its ionization fraction is super low. All right, so this was supposed to be what I skipped to. Could not get there, but it looks fun. But to, to summarize this part, um, through all these analyses, we aim to piece together all these different elements to try and identify what are the most important or disruptive factors for driving planet formation. Is it the cluster? Is it the central star? Is it the you know, cosmic rays shining into the, the deep uh, midplane layers? Of course, this is not the end of the story, right? Planets, what planets look like right after formation is not where they end up. There are plenty of effects. There's dynamical effects, there's geological effects, atmospheric evolution, stellar variations. All that will determine the final outcome. But you know, more accurate representations of that starting place, that disk, what happens just at the very beginning, both chemically and physically, are really crucial for understanding and modeling these later stages more accurately. Now, Planet formation, I'm not trying to solve planet formation by any means, either you know, in the next five years or 10 years. It is an inherently complex process. It involves many different fields, many different people. But the data and the models are rapidly improving. Compositional studies have benefited greatly from these beautiful observations of in-depth uh, uh, single source or multiple source studies. And now we're moving to an era of statistics to figure out what is the most common types of uh, planet forming disks sort of the opposite of what exoplanets did, right? <laughs> but these are, these are crucial, because these better physical and chemical models are gonna feed into better uh, planet, for example, planet population synthesis models, which will give us statistics on the planets, both those we can see and those that are unseen. And for the practical you know, means, they can also help guide us in our choices of candidates to sort of follow up once more Earth-like planets are observationally you know, accessible. And maybe, you know, for the time being at least, they can inspire our imagination of what planets possibly could be, at least in terms of habitable planets. All right, so I just want to thank uh, my group, my lovely, you know, the humans I get to work with every day, our funding agencies, and also to you uh, for your attention. Thank you all. Here, I'll put that back up. Question for...
Yeah, that is an excellent question. So the D to H ratio, at least within the local bubble, it's fairly well constrained. So the D to H ratio, you know, we're, that's going to maybe add to the uncertainty of sort of, I would say, 20 to 30 percent. Some of the deuterium is getting, you know, put into things like HDO or organics, but it's actually a pretty small percent. So we're, the D to H ratio is uh, not the biggest source of uncertainty, but it's one we think about. Really, the hardest part with uh, HD and um, those that the, the, the one to zero emission line is knowing the temperature structure. Because the line, it's upper state energy, it's like 100K. So you need warm gas. You're not seeing cold, cold gas. So, um, but we can get that. We can get that with ALMA. So it's, it's a thing we can, with ALMA and with a far infrared telescope, we can get to. So I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Um, I was. I'm confident you and your use of astronomy are going to The moment zero maps, yeah, yeah, blue, icy. <laughs> yeah, these are. This is velocity integrated. Yeah, velocity integrated. Yeah. Velocity integrated. Exactly. So my question is, do you have good enough velocity resolution in these things to actually? I mean, I've seen these things taken out. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. Like there is. I mean. The, the spectral resolution for ALMA, you know, it's, it's excellent. We're often downgrading it to you know, improve signals to noise on the, the imaging. So that, yeah, resolution has not been an issue. Uh, you do have to spend a lot of time. So if you're splitting your light, you know, into many tiny fine beams and into many tiny fine channels, you need maps quality data, I think. But, you know, that is, for bright lines, you know, that is achievable in, I would say, hours of time. Yeah. So there's some hope of, like, you just keep showing this big model and saying it's important. Yeah. And especially, you know, for these disks where you're, they're slightly inclined, there is some, like, confusion be between the, like, the front, the foreground, and the background. But, like, some disks we have edge-on cases. So then you get to, like, just piece together all the layers. So, yeah, it's, there is a lot. There is, there is not just hope. It is, it is there. The data are there. Yeah. Oh, I guess, yeah, listen to her. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going back. So for the dust, you mean? Yes. For anything. Yeah, I mean, the, the big question in, you know, coming up with, like, accurate dust masses, you have to know the distance, but we have the total brightness. We, the composition of the grains, like, what you assume for the opacity, that's actually where a lot of the magic comes in. And for the Heiss uh, Mulder's comparison, that 100% planet formation eek, you know, study, they were just taking the flux and not correcting for optical depth. They did a lot, they went through a lot of hoops to correct for, un, like, they didn't correct for additional unseen planets, but they corrected for stellar metallicity and a lot of different factors on the planet side. But on the disk side, purely assumed it was optically thin. So I think the biggest caveat isn't necessarily the absolute, it's, you know, are, we, are the assumptions correct that got us to the mass? And I think that's, that's the, big, the big question for disk dust mass. <laughs> There's a lot of room to hide. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's the question is why. So if we have all these caveats for converting, you know, dust into planets and or sorry, dust in uh, to to total disk mass, and we're like using things like well maybe planets formed as our way out. 
you have to do it in a way that still preserves the trend. That the more massive disks still sim seem to have, they haven't like over converted most of their mass into gas giants, and the smaller disks can't have like under converted. It kind of all had to happen together, which is like to me seems odd, right? So yes, there is a lot of room to hide, uh, but it's still the trend is still interesting. And if um, I didn't show it, but it, Carlo made the same plot with using CO-based gas masses, and it was a scatter plot. It was just there was zero trend at all. So the dust correlated well, like, okay, well is the Cor correlated, okay. But the gas didn't, the CO gas, I should say. I know, it is, it is. It worries me. Small thing that piqued my interest in about four or five slides before the end, you showed the time on the x axis. Uh, I was curious, the, uh, the second panel from the top yes. is O2. O2. And I'm wondering what's going on with that. Yeah, so what Abby found was that, you know, she had no, mo she had no O2 in her models to start with. So, so the basic, the, the quick behind the scenes of what this is, is Abby created a, a chemical model, assumed it was in steady state, no flares for the first 100,000 years, and then she kicked flares off. Because the, the trouble with these models, or the, the hard part, is that you have to run them in like half an hour time steps, but you want to run them for a million years. <laughs> takes a while. Um, even with the fastest solver, it takes a while. So to get around that, she fast forwards the chemistry to some reasonable time, 100,000 years, or no, this was 500,000 years, and then turned on flares. And so what happened is that flares didn't directly impact O2 in the same way HCO plus would just, boom, explode. Every single time a flare hit, H, uh, HCO plus responded, into H plus did the same. But O2, it was like a slow, like stealing oxygen from CO and putting it into O2. And so we don't know if this stops. Does it ever level off? Does it actually increase O2 abundance in time? And so that's something, if we, you know, if we have a way in which we can get this running for astrophysically interesting timescales beyond 500 years, does this O2 explain issues? It doesn't seem to be yeah. Yeah, so where does the new steady state uh, hit? We don't know. Yeah, so it might, uh, I don't know if this is, you know, sort of what, what, you're, what peak, is piquing your interest, but there's this issue with comets having an excessively high O2 abundance. So maybe flare, flaring activity might have enriched O2 in the, the icy comets early on, so possibly. One other comment about the EHT that, yeah. you know, we're proposing to do, we hope to do, is, is uh, to do it with enough uh, spectral resolving power that we can get the intrinsic line profile Yes. Which, if you combine with this simple Keplerian motion, uh, will give you, should give you the radial distribution of the gas. Yes. So it's not just the total amount of HD, but uh, hopefully you know, the, the radial distribution of the gas. Yes, and that's actually the project Amanda Alvarado will be working on um, in my group is, you know, what can we learn about, what, how much information is hiding inside of the spectra? If it's full of rings and gaps, will this alter the profile in some way? Can we even see it, or you know, can we get bulk distribution? So yeah, definitely. Okay, so I am gonna end the questions there. We're right on time. Uh, Ilse's sort of scheduled schedule is full, but you'll be there at coffee tomorrow. So if you want to chat to Ilse for some quick questions, just come to see if you have coffee. And with that, let's thank Ilse again. Thank you.